I'm Nevada Governor Brian Sandoval and just got to ride an Uber jump. It was a lot of fun. I really want to encourage all the attendees, but especially the governors, to take a ride. People are using it to fill in gaps in their day where maybe an Uber doesn't make sense. Are you going from like a jump hub to another jump hub or do you just ditch it at your meeting and just leave this beautiful red bike out on the Some, Somewhere in between. So you've got an integrated lock right on the side. Uh, you can lock it to a uh, bike rack. Oh, come on. Safety first. Which way are we going? <laughs> Here we go. Let's see what we can do. Feel that. Well, and then if you shift up to like yeah. fifth gear, this thing moves. It was a blast fun, safe, great way for mobility to get around town. I encourage all the attendees, but especially the governors, to take a ride on the Uber Jump. They are fun. And they even come with a bell. Where's the bell? It's just the handlebar deal. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone back. Try it. That's what happens on break. <laughs> Good morning again. I'd like to welcome everyone back. My name's Steve Bullock, uh, Governor of Montana. Thank you all for joining us for this, what I think is a really important discussion. Once we really working to achieve racial equity, let's try to calm the conversations down now. Thank you very much. Governor Schneider. Thank you for that fine effort. <laughs> Look, working to achieve racial equity and inclusion in today's workforce, it's really critical to ensuring that all Americans find the sustainable jobs that they need to achieve both successful and fulfilling lives. Our country has certainly made strides in equality in the last 100 years. But we also need to recognize that barriers to good jobs remain disproportionate for people of color. And when these barriers hold any Americans back from good jobs, they hold us all back. And they stifle growth, and they stifle innovation. I'm very pleased to get to welcome Lejeune Montgomery Tiburon to kick off the discussion today about how we can remove some of those barriers. Ms. Taboran is the president and CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Kellogg, if you're unaware, is one of the largest private foundations in the United States and dedicates itself to championing vulnerable children and working families. Her leadership has indeed driven countless communities across our country to more equitable and prosperous future. And it is truly my honor to join her today to talk about the impacts of racial disparities in and outside of the workplace. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Tebron. Thank you so much, Governor Bullock. And I really want to start by thanking the NGA for inviting philanthropy into this space. I'm honored to represent philanthropy and I'm hoping that this conversation continues to illuminate the partnerships that we can forge together. Uh, but I'd like to start out by sharing a little bit about the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, uh, who we are and, and why we are here today talking about racial equity, uh, particularly in the business sector. 
Um, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation was founded in 1930 by the serial pioneer Will Keith Kellogg, who was a visionary, an innovator, uh, and, and an entrepreneur. But during his career, he and his family experienced challenges as they were amassing uh, a great wealth. And because of that, he was able to empathize with people who were less fortunate. And he was particularly interested in children because children were unable to advocate for themselves. And so he wanted his wealth to promote the health, happiness, and well-being of children. And in order to do that, he established the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Uh, and today, we're worth about $8.5 billion. And we have been pursuing his vision for almost 88 years now. And what we know today is that um, we've learned a lot in this space. And we know that in order to sustain all of the work that we've done, we have to concentrate and focus on root causes of disparities. And so as we think about our future and the reason that we've produced such a document as the business case for racial equity, we've done that because we believe that it's reflecting some root causes that we have to address uh, in this country and in our states. But we know that children thrive when they are nestled in families, stable families and working families. And families thrive when they're in equitable communities. And so our way forward is working with communities because we believe that change happens at the local level. And when we work with communities, we hope that as they build transformative practices that we can then inspire our nation to embrace an equity agenda as well. So that is our theory of change. That is why we do this work community by community. And we believe in partnerships. We partner with governors, like some of you in the room. We partner with organizations who have a mission to remove barriers and inequality. And together with those organizations, we believe that we can promote practices that can scale across this country. Particularly in the business case, what it says is um, that we are leaving money on the table today as a nation because we are not preparing every capable person in the work environment. And the money is real. The business case says that nationally, if we were to put every working person of working age into the economy, that we would create an immediate $3 trillion wow. of GDP. Yeah. And it also says that by 2050, that number would be $8 trillion. And so we know that there is potential, there's capacity, and there's an economic imperative for us to act and to be sure that we are leveraging our human capital in order for this country to compete in, in the economic markets today. And that's in this report, right, Lejeune? Because I love how you present it in some ways. We often think that racial equity in the workforce is a moral imperative, but anybody that thinks morality and economics are separated, that's a false assumption. And the report lays out the money that we're leaving on the table. As Absolutely, yeah. it's very clear. And, and there are several imperatives. There's an economic imperative. Uh, there's a competitive advantage imperative. We have to compete as a nation and we are losing as we are not preparing all of our workforce uh, to participate. And so that is very palpable as well as we think about all of the different uh, new technologies as we just discussed and, and how we must make sure 
that everyone can participate in these new economies. And do you see the trends really impacting racial equity in the workplace when we look at increase of automation and artificial intelligence? We do, um, and I want to say that as we are making this case, we're making it nationally and we're making it state by state. And the documents that we have today represent the places where we work. So we have a Michigan business case. We have a New Mexico business case. We have a New Orleans business case. And we hope that every state would want sure. to calculate and quantify uh, what that lost potential is in dollars. In Michigan, for example, is over a billion dollars of additional state tax revenue that we're leaving on the table because we are not um, employing all of our residents. Uh, in the space of technology and artificial intelligence, uh, I think we have to be very careful as we move forward in this space. We can either create great opportunities for all or we can unintentionally perpetuate the same in the inequitable practices that has gotten us to this point today. I think it's important for us to think about technology as a tool to either include or to continue to weed out people in the process. Uh, there's an effort in philanthropy looking at how there could be a potential of artificial intelligence to actually embed biases that humans have today into the technology, which would further wow. create inequality and opportunities for, uh, for people. But I think as we work on this together, we can be sure to have that lens, the racial equity lens, and with that, be able to approach and address these biases before they become the new reality. Now, if we look even over the last decade, uh, the cost of childcare has increased about 25%, often making workers or families choose between working and caring for the child. Stunning as I learned that in 33 states, infant care costs exceed the average cost of college tuition in those states. How does that lack of affordable, high quality child care impact racial equity? And if so, what should, uh, are, well, are there child care policies that are working to address that fundamental inequality? There, this is a, a very complex space, but a very important space. Um, and as I say, because Mr. Kellogg cared so much about children, this is a space where we have invested for decades. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is I believe that dollars spent in early childhood education as soon as possible are the best dollars spent. And we all know that uh, your return on your dollar in this space is 13 to one. Uh, so it is very important that we and all of our states fully embrace early childhood education and development but it's also a workforce uh, issue. None of these issues are siloed or isolated. So in the case of workforce, access to early childhood care and development is a problem. Uh, the cost is one impediment. Uh, space and facility is an issue. Quality is an issue. And one of the things we're learning is that employers uh, understand this just as well as we do in the philanthropic sector because a great space for, for child care creates uh, a more attentive worker, a, a more um, productive worker. And so employers understand that if we don't deal with the child care issue, we are also impacting economic growth and development. And some of the things that we've been doing is creating multi-sectoral tables where employers are sitting side by side with parents who have children and people who are trying to support this sector to come up with very innovative solutions around how you marry all of these issues and create systems that actually work 
and today they're fragmented. We haven't spoken with one another. Uh, and so, you know, some of the work that we're doing, even in Michigan, where um, we're thinking about how the employers might even have some of these uh, se settings close to where the job is. We're thinking about the time that, that child care is available. Uh, we need second shift opportunities, third shift opportunities. We also are thinking about the pipeline you can create of employment for child care providers. And this is a market that has been underdeveloped. Uh, community colleges can play a part in building a pipeline, which could also lead to the teacher shortage and the pipeline that we have there as well. So there's a lot of work going right. on, and it is some of the most important work in this space around workforce. That is great. That, you know, governors clearly occupy a kind of unique role um, in our states and collectively. Have you identified a challenge to racial equity? Do you believe the governors are uniquely situated uh, to make sig significant progress in addressing in our states? And if so, what is that? Yes, um, I have a few examples. Um, the first example that I think I'm really excited about is some work that we have done in Michigan, and Governor Snyder was a part of this work. Uh, but I sit on a, a workforce task force, and again, this task force includes employers, it includes uh, the, the public sector and other providers. And as the employers were thinking about the trucking industry of the future and looking at barriers to employment in a city like Detroit, what they learned is more than half the drivers in Detroit were off the road because of driver responsibility fees and uh, different taxes, per se, that were preventing them to keep their licenses. And the employers were saying, you know, these fees are so unbearable that they do create a physical barrier for people to work, and too many people are out of yeah. the market because of these fees. And so, because we identified that, we took that conversation to the governor, and the employers were champions of this work, and thank goodness our governor understands economic growth and development and signed uh, a law to eliminate these driver responsibility fees because he knew the connection to growth and prosperity. So that's just one example. I think another example uh, that we're working on is, is, is how do you provide uh, training opportunities for people who are maybe mid-career and want to be uh, re-educated or certified in another area? Yeah, and that's area. part of, that's part of our initiative that will be unrolling tomorrow, the Good Jobs for All Americans. Absolutely. How do we do that with sort of mid-career folks, and how can we also ensure that we're um, addressing racial equity in doing so? I, again, I think there are projects underway, uh, but one area I think that we're going back to is the area of vocational education, uh, and we're looking at that from uh, a K through 12 perspective, but I think it's also an avenue for uh, adults who are looking to re-enter the workforce. So we funded uh, vocational centers where during the day they can bring students into the space, but then in the evening they can bring adults. I think the most important perspective as it relates to racial equity is to begin to think about how you build connections to those populations, people who have been disengaged and not participating in the workforce in, in the past. And we can't assume that it's a one-size-fits-all approach to getting them back into the, the market. Yeah, yeah. We have to understand how you build trust and connect with people where they are. And a lot of our programs work in a community engagement space where we are working with organizations that have real relationships with individuals and have built trust so that the people in the market can come back. I Can you mention 
I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah. I thought one of the cool things when we were talking before is these parent academies. Exactly. Because I think we all struggle with, we have workers out there that ought to be upskilled or mid-career folks, and like, how do we actually reach out to them? Exactly. And how do we engage them? Right. And I thought that was such yeah. a cool thing that so you guys did. So we were sharing uh, a project that's underway is called uh, the Parent Academy, which is connected to the public school system. And the Parent Academy captures all of the parents of students within the school, uh, particularly at early age, and then that relationship can continue throughout the course of the child's academic career. But the concept is to bring the parent into the school to get them more engaged with their child, but while they're there, to begin to talk to them about how they want to pursue a career, to give them resume, resume writing uh, support, to talk to them about soft skills, to see if we want to connect them to a certificate program or a training program elsewhere. Uh, and what we're finding is when we attach those supports to a space where they trust and will come because of their children, we're having better uh, opportunities to plug them right. in and keep them motivated toward uh, the different careers that they choose. That's really and it's great. working well. Uh, it worked, this is a program that was uh, offered in Florida with great success and, and now it's being offered in Michigan and I believe that it has potential to be offered in other places as well. That's great, Lachine. We're also, uh, as I get ready to sort of roll out that initiative tomorrow, one of the things that we're looking at is that often more rural communities certainly face some unique challenges, hopefully some opportunities too, as a result of the new economy um, that we're seeing. And do you see, uh, unique challenges or opportunities in, to promoting racial equity in rural areas yes. as well? Uh, me, there are some for sure. The one that comes immediately to mind is uh, transportation and connecting rural and urban communities together. Um, one of the things in, we note in the business case for racial equity is uh, resources that we could create in the transportation space by upskilling and, and making sure that every person participates in the workforce. But transportation is the big key, I think, for keeping everyone mobile. And when we talk about mobility, that is typically a barrier uh, for employment and especially the quality employment opportunities that exist. And so I think governors who are focused on connecting and creating regional transportation systems will be those that reach both rural and urban in, in the economic recovery. You're doing incredible work in this. So let's say that you woke up tomorrow and it might have been a bad dream, but somehow you're no longer the president of the Kellogg Foundation. You find yourself as a governor. What is what is the one that thing that, that you'd say, yeah, well, you know, I don't know. It sounds like you're certainly doing good work all around the country and yeah. the world. But like, what's the one thing that you'd tell every governor, look, we got to address this. It's right. good for our economy. It's important just from a base morality yeah. of what we are yeah. as a nation. Mm -hmm. What's the one thing you'd tell us all to do tomorrow? Okay, the first thing I would say, um, is get out of denial. Uh, we can't deny that the issues aren't real in our communities. Yeah. Uh, and, and it isn't about politics. It's about growth and opportunity and prosperity for the future. Uh, and so those who can step forward and face the truth of the current reality and begin to build the pathways forward will be on the forefront, will be the leaders right. of tomorrow. But you have to step beyond, uh, I think, the rhetoric and reach into your neighborhoods and, and speak with the people. And they're not invisible, they're real human beings. And they actually, not only can we help them, but they can help us. Yeah. This is a, a, a win-win solution. We all are in this together. It's our own shared fate. And 
When I think about the business community that is in this presence, the international business community, I think we must show them that we can build a workforce for the future. And uh, the sooner we know that there's opportunity there and admit that there's uh, potential there, the sooner we can get in front of it. That's darn good advice. I know, um, and I really appreciate you spending time. I want to open it up, though, uh, turn to fellow governors, as they may have questions for you. I'd like to start with uh, Governor Schneider. Well, thanks. I have to start by thanking Lejeune for being here, and I have to give one short commercial for the foundation that I'm actually a native of Battle Creek. I yes. was born and raised in that town, and I started my college career at Kellogg Community College, yes. a place that wouldn't have existed but for this foundation. So I owe a lot to this organization, and they've done wonderful work for decades, and they're continuing to do so. Thank you, Governor. Um, beyond that, though, it's been really exciting, the work they're doing in Michigan and how we're partnering to do these things. And one comment that I'd be interested in Lejeune's observation is, is something that was la combining sort of last session with this session, that we've done a lot of work on what's helped keeping structurally unemployed people from having opportunity. And the largest single reason we found in all our research is the lack of transportation to either work or train. Mm -hmm. And so this is back to the autonomous and connected vehicles. This is back to public transportation. And how do you integrate that? Because it doesn't work if you don't have public transportation to get you there, or it takes three hours because it's four stops. Correct. So, Lejeune, I appreciate your thoughts mm -hmm. on how we could continue to collaborate on that, in addition to all the Marshall Plan things we're doing with competency-based certificates. Exactly. Uh, and as I said earlier, transportation, I think, is going to be um, a real issue for the future, and it has been of the past. And, and I do think there's an opportunity there for further deployment of technology and, and ways to connect. Uh, one of the things that um, is interesting is there are formal transportation systems, and then there are many informal transportation systems, but they're not connected fully. So, the biggest opportunity I think we have is to, to build uh, a collaboration around transportation that includes public transportation, uh, private transportation, and speaking with community about where their mobility exists and where it doesn't. Churches are a fine opportunity to include in a conversation about transportation. Um, there are, you know, Trans church vehicles that are very active on Sunday and not as active the rest of the week. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity for partnership there, but I think in the transportation space, we must really look at both formal and informal systems in that regard uh, as a way to, to begin to connect the dots. And you know, I think also in that space, Rural to urban is key. And uh, of course, mass transit is a part of that, but also many light rail, but just uh, different pathways forward, I think, is going to be the answer. It's not going to be a one size fits all solution. Any of my colleagues have questions? Governor Carney. I do, and thank you very much, and thank you very much for the information uh, that you've provided. I've been looking, as you've been speaking at this kind of one page of the business case for racial equity, a strategy for growth 2018, and on the back it has a list of, of 12 items, and it says at the bottom for, for more information, uh, go to this website. Yes. But I'm going to ask the same question that Governor Bullock asked. Is there, there are a lot of things that we're, some of which we're doing already, some well, some not so well. What worries me as governor of Delaware in the Mid-Atlantic region, I met with the uh, president of the Philadelphia Fed a couple weeks ago, and he told me something that really knocked me over, which was that our labor participation rate in the region is going to go down over the next five to ten years, mostly because people are retiring and, and getting out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so we can't afford not to have everybody fully participating in the Correct. workforce. 
So you're making that point, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, economic uh, imperative for this, but what among these 12 items would you point mm -hmm. me to in terms of priority, which I guess was yes. the same yes. question that, that, uh, that mm -hmm. Governor Bullock asked. Your answer was, get out of denial. Okay, once you mm -hmm. get past denial, what's right. next? Okay, past denial. There's a wonderful opportunity, I think, if you go into the mass incarceration system. We have many returning citizens who are also still on the sidelines because of uh, having to check a box that there has been a past felony, unable to access capital, unable to get financial aid for college uh, uh, ach achievement. So there are many policies in the space where I think, again, we have opportunities if people have been in, incarcerated and served uh, a sentence on the way out. I'm wondering if there are better bridges and pathways to bring them back into the workforce. Uh, what we've done in that regard is we've provided loan funds, for example. Um, unfortunately, that has been the pathway because they can't get a job. Right. And so what we've done is we've allowed them to establish their own businesses. And what we find is when they open their own businesses, they actually hire their own kind. And so we're employing many people in that market, uh, but it's because of uh, we've deal we're dealing with those barriers that unfortunately and sometimes uh, are legislative barriers that will not allow these people to return back into communities and be productive citizens. Any other questions? Yeah, the other one, Lejeune, is the whole issue about encouraging more competency-based certificates, both to help people coming out of school because, and to help with lifelong yes. learning. Because there are so many positions out there that you can get a certificate after one year, two year, that lead to a sixty, seventy thousand dollar job that's above the average pay job. And I appreciate how we can yes. encourage more of those. Absolutely, and I spoke of one opportunity earlier um, in the technology market. Uh, what we're learning is the ability to code is uh, something that can be trained. And in fact, uh, what is known is they say if you bring children into a room one in five of those children will have the acumen to code and be a very good coder in the technological space uh, and be able to be trained to have an, an $80,000 job. And that's just population writ, writ large. large. Exactly. Interesting. And so what states are doing in communities is they are bringing young people together and having what they call hackathons or coding sessions and competitions where young people compete and build apps and learn to code, and then those with the acumen are further developed. They get internships in some of the uh, technology companies, and we're starting to build that pipeline. But without the intentionality, because public school systems lack those type of curriculums, they will be left out of that market completely. And so what we're trying to do is build those pathways back for young people in the technology space. But that's one example where people can be certified and trained. I, I do think, as I said earlier, um, understanding from employers where they have the need and the gaps is something that we've been working on as well. So building those employer tables where they tell you exactly what their need will be, not only today, but in the future, is critical. Uh, in Battle Creek, what we've done is we've brought all of our businesses together, and they've actually mapped the retirements of their employers over the next 10 years. And they know exactly where the retirement gaps will uh, prevent, ch create challenges, and those are the places where we've included community colleges and other training institutions to work on those before that time period arrives where the gap exists. So there's a partnership there that I think we can forge to, to make that certification process very relevant to the needs of today. I was saying to Lejeune earlier that one of the things that we did in Montana is we have 
seven land-based tribal colleges, or seven reservations, and we have apprenticeship programs tailored for each individual tribal college of the seven, saying what are the workforce needs, what are the opportunities there, and often, as Governor Schneider points out, it's a professional certificate that's gonna get somebody up that career ladder. But I'd also note that when we did this, we couldn't have done it without philanthropy. It was philanthropy that actually helped us get this going. So one other piece of advice, uh, if you woke up from that long evening of nightmare and became a governor, um, what would you suggest, how can governors better work with the philanthropic community to attain and achieve our mutual goals? Yes, I think that's a great opportunity. Uh, and I think you can start with just forging the conversations. What we do is uh, there's a, a moment in philanthropy where we actually intentionally connect just to make sure that we know uh, our, the leaders in the state that we're working in and they know what we're doing and then looking for those moments of alignment. Uh, I think um, maybe it's not as um, intuitive that we want the same thing. We are, I find more and more that we are all working toward the same outcomes. And, and foundations, of course, are totally bipartisan. And so we look for winning solutions regardless of where they come from. And so I think the beginning of the partnership starts with conversation, with connecting the dots of uh, the goals for the state. Uh, we are you know, we want to be a part of the solution. What we can share is some of the work that we're doing. A, a foundation like mine, we're international, we're across the United States, we've provided resources and tested projects. We know what, you know, we've learned things that work well and other challenges and mishaps that have occurred throughout the work. Uh, and if, any, if, if nothing else, we can share with you where people have gotten into trouble and begin to leverage that learning toward faster outcomes that states can make in this space. But it starts with just building a, re a relationship. Fantastic. Well, I think that you gave us both a lot um, to think about, but also a challenge and to do that much more. So. Thank you so much for being here, yes. uh, sparking this conversation, and please join me in thanking Ms. Tabron. Now, I was given absolutely no guidance as to what happens. Is there a break? Oh. We're going to go right on to our next uh, panel, so please.